There we go. And then I want to make sure the chat is working. And we'll just give people a couple of minutes to log in. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Welcome to Millicent Unplugged. Um, at the Millicent Rogers Museum, we are located on the ancestral lands of Tiwa speaking people known today as the Red Willow people of Taos Pueblo. We strive to deepen our relationship with the Red Willow people through collaboration while acknowledging and honoring the complex history of the Red Willow people past, present, and future. We expressed gratitude to the land and to the Taos Pueblo elders and ancestors who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. Welcome and uh, welcome to my friend, Sarah Francis, volunteer extraordinaire and moderator of Millicent Unplugged. Tonight's topic is painters with grit, the art of soft pastels. Thank you for joining us in this conversation with three prolific and honored artists from the current MRM exhibition of New Mexico Pastel Society artists participating in the society's 30th National Pastel Painting Exhibition. We hope to explore the art, the materials, the challenges, the inspiration, and the timeless appeal of pastel painting. Marilyn Drake, named Local Treasure 2014 by the Albuquerque Art Business Association. Marilyn originally hails from New York and has moved to the land of enchantment with a graphic design background and a deep desire to be a fine artist. Welcome, Marilyn. Paul Murray describes his paintings as a series of questions as is inspired by the goal of continually refining his craft. Paul's work has won numerous international awards and is included in such prominent collections as the City of Albuquerque Public Art and the U.S. State Department Permanent Collection, among others. Welcome, Paul. Nicholas Tesluk has been involved in arts his entire life, from music to drawing to performance art. Nicholas's focus shifted exclusively to pastels in the 90s, and he is in his ninth year as chair of the Pastel Society of New Mexico National Show. Nicholas has had the unique experience of modeling as costumed characters for life drawing groups, which has led to a new interest in figure painting. Welcome, Nicholas. This program is best viewed in gallery view, located in the upper right corner of your Zoom screen. Feel free to use the chat feature. And we uh, also try to end the program with 15 minutes of Q&A if you would like to enter questions into the Q&A feature. Um, the chat feature will allow for you as the audience to participate in the discussion real time in the moment, whereas the question submitted through Q&A will be at the end. Please type hello in the chat if you choose and let us know where you're from. Sarah, you wanna lead us off? I sure will. Um, the first thing that I wanna talk about is the extraordinary misinterpretation of what is pastel. Most people, they say, oh, well, that's what you paint the new baby's bedroom with, is those very soft kind of fugitive colors. And that's not the truth at all. Uh, it is as brilliant. And here's, this is my late mother's favorite pastel by the late artist Paul Contney, who was a Southwestern uh, well-known painter. And look at the bright colors there. And um, by rights, uh, Nicholas, would you be so kind as to kind of lead us off and tell our audience, what is the difference between old fashioned chalk, uh, mm -hmm. oil pastels, crayons, soft pastels, all of these different mediums, because most people don't know. Oh, well, sure. Uh, I'm pleased to, to talk about it. Uh, pastel is pure pigment. It's the same pigment that's used in oil painting and watercolors. Um, however, instead of being mixed with linseed oil as oil paints are, or with uh, 
Arabic, gum Arabic as watercolors are. It is just uh, just a, a slight amount of binder in it, which is gum tragicanth, which uh, they, they put enough binder in it just to make sure that it's a firm dough. Then they roll it up like a snake and uh, and some, some of them are different shapes, uh, but basically you're painting with pure pigment. Uh, chalk, when uh, pastel people never like the term chalk when say a uh, chalk. Um, chalk is basically gypsum with a, uh, a colorant to it. Uh, basically pastel colors, as you, you mentioned, like a baby's room. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, pastels, uh, pastel sticks are you can have very dark colors, deep colors, as as the painting behind you shows. Uh, bright, brilliant colors. And the good thing about pastels is that when they're put on the paper, uh, and usually a, a textured surface so that it holds the pastel, uh, it will stay that way. It'll look that way for centuries, providing it's uh, not become wet or something like that. Whereas uh, paint will sometimes fade over time. It uh, will crack often, uh, oil paint. Uh, pastels, uh, there are 18th century paintings that look exactly the same today as they did. Then. So, uh, at, and then when you, you mentioned oil pastel, oil pastel is a different type of a of a pastel, it's got more of a waxy, more feels more like a combination between oil paint and crayon. Uh, we only work in the pastel society uh, with soft pastels, and soft pastels sometimes uh, sounds like okay, it has to be something that's really soft to the touch. But we also have new pastels, which are hard pastels. We have pastel pencils, which use uh, almost like a like a lead like a colored pencil type feel so s saying soft pastel is a little bit of a misnomer mm -hmm. uh, but we, we differentiate between soft pastel and oil pastel and those that's probably the difference we any anything in our show does not have oil pastels in it Fabulous. Thank you. Now, uh, there's another thing. And Paul, I would go to you if I might on this one. Uh, with uh, really, I guess the Italians were kind of the first ones who began to do this. And of course, they had just a couple of colors, a red and a black and maybe a, a, a sepia or something originally, because they were just beginning to experiment. And then when this started to um, become in vogue in the uh, 1700s or, or so, how many colors were there then? And how many colors can you get your soft pastels in now? Well, every medium uses the same pigments. It's just that the binder is different. And, and if I could add to what Nicholas said, um, the great thing about pastels is what makes pigments archival is, is the density of the pigments and pastels are extremely dense in pigmentation. But um, pastel is a medium that has had pigments and colors available um, the same way that oil painters and um, egg tempera painters, I think in, the, in that time period were using. So um, pretty much everything that was available to the oil painters was available to pastel painters at the same time. Uh, and it wasn't until maybe the 19th century when people started getting more, more you know, there were more pigments available. There were more kinds of discoveries of, of materials that would create pigments. So the, the earlier pastels were limited more or less to the same range of colors that the oil painters were. And that was a, a fairly, fairly narrow range. Um, there weren't any um, um, incredible greens at the time. Um, yellows were difficult. Blues were easy. Um, um, it just depended on what was available and, 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 and where you could get the pigments. 
the um, I have heard that there are well over 1500 different tones and manufacturers now. Uh, so yes, that grew exponentially. Now, I, if I can move to something that is a girl thing, <laughs> Marilyn, I was amazed to find out that one of the most prominent early portraitists was a woman, um, Rosalba Carriera. Mm -hmm. Tell us about her. Well, um, she, I honestly can tell you I know of her and I probably recognize her paintings if I saw them in an art history book, but I haven't done extensive research on what her paintings were like. However, we all know that there were many women artists um, of her time period and other times and uh, using pastel was something that was very easy for them uh, to work with. There was also Rosa Bonheur, who did that wonderful painting uh, of the magnificent large past uh, painting of the horses. She was allowed to do things um, in French society that was usually women were not allowed to like go out wearing trousers and she was granted the opportunity to do that. So I think it's worth using the internet to Google famous women painters from centuries ago and see the range of techniques and materials that those artists used. I was just fascinated to see the detail of some of these things. I think her dates go from the late 1700s into mid 1800s. And um, it, the and of course, yes, it was an accepted thing for women to do. And it wasn't quite so messy <laughs> as the oil paints were. So I suppose in their beautiful outfits, <laughs> they would dress to paint. Uh, but I wanted to show immediately some of your portraitists, because that's, uh, my opinion, a a rather challenging part of this because of the shading on faces. And it, it, tell us about your, your techniques and your, um, well, are you exclusively uh, portraits? What do, what do you do? Well, um, I do a lot of figurative work. I can't say, I mean, though those pictures clearly resemble the people who were posing for those pictures, I didn't do them as a commissioned portrait. I run a drawing, I am part of a studio in Albuquerque and we have weekly drawing sessions and models come in and I generally set up what I hope can become a painting. But I also view anytime I get a chance to do this as practice so that I can improve my skills at you know, doing figurative work or landscape work or anything else. And, oh, excuse me, the idea is to try and really get a resemblance to the person and use the classic techniques of using values and shading. And um, then, you know, color is the big excitement, but hopefully it's the underlying drawing and the use of values that makes the picture stand out. Yeah, I, I think that that's what impressed me seeing these in person at the museum was the transition of tones and the dimensionality of it. And I, I want to put up one of Nicholas's pieces, these, because they are so different and I, I mean, they look like they are out of um, the antique times when uh, still lives um, were extraordinary. I mean, they look absolutely real. And I'm amazed. Tell us about how you blend things. I, I've heard that some people put lines of color right next to each other, expecting the eye of the viewer to blend it, and others use the finger or a, a little stub? What do you do to get this extraordinary reality? 
uh, I, I use my finger and I, my technique, I, a lot of my still life, I like to, uh, one of my favorite artists is Caravaggio and I love the, uh, the chiaroscuro of his paintings. And that's what I strive for with many of my still lifes, try and make sure that the, uh, the light is falling on, on certain portions of the painting. Uh, and yes, to, to get the, the, the effect that I do, uh, I don't blend it everywhere, but in certain parts. Uh, and, and a lot of times the finished part is not blended, but I blended to get the, the realism of the, uh, of the technique that I'm doing. So, uh, yeah, I'm, it's, I, I work in still with still lifes and sunsets and my sunsets are a little looser, but my still lifes, I, I not only have a photograph, I take a photograph of the still life. So I have the lighting the way I want it. And then I also set it up in my studio with the still life. Hopefully it's not something like the orange there, you know, it, it'll, uh, <laughs> rot, you know, if you keep it too long while you're working on it, but, uh, the grapes will will and stuff, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, I, I I use both the photograph on my uh, iPad and the still life setup itself. But with the still life setup, it, I can't get the lighting that I have in the photograph because I I'm lighting my painting, so that's why I use both. So that's interesting. Well, I'm looking at particularly at the reflections. On, on the large dark mug, I mean, that is so real that even flat here, looking at it as just a reproduction, I can feel that mug. And, and the grapes, um, you, you expect to grab them and pop them in your mouth. Uh, and, and part of that is indeed that lighting that you're talking about, getting it just as you wanted. And it's so different from Marilyn's technique. And it's so different from Paul's technique, which I, I will have to admit, I really adore these pictures that are, I don't know, they're a little abstract, and yet they're not. And I, I the, the color back and forth between that is just it just is so in your face that you know that it's southwest <laughs> so paul tell us about how you see your technique different from theirs i have um become as i've matured as an artist or grown older is probably more accurate um been more and more obsessed with color. Uh, before, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I was, I was um, really interested in accuracy in having value relationships be correct. And now I'm not so much interested in that. I'm, I'm more interested in, in the emotion of a painting and changing color or substituting color uh, goes a long way uh, towards changing the emotional um, content of a painting. It, 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 if you see a wall and you're used to looking at it being a sand color and all of a sudden it's a dark blue color like that um, painting of the electric electrical boxes, um, it's, it's, it just adds some a dimension to the work that, that I feel that I didn't have before and I'm really interested in it and I'm pursuing more of that kind of painting um, as I go forward. Tell us about that one specifically. Sorry, Karen, I stepped on you. I'm going to jump in. I, I, I'll say something a little bit because I've spoken with Paul about that particular painting and it was in the show last year and he had it with him in person at his demo um, a couple of weekends ago. And that is one of my favorite paintings. And what is so stunning to me about it is when you see it, you accept its beauty and it's that color and you just accept the beauty and it doesn't even occur to you, oh, that was stucco, that's a different color. It's just stunningly beautiful. And I think it has to do with not only the color combinations, but the, the play with 
the geometric lines, the very linear aspect of the, the electrical boxes, and then the softness of the land that's right beneath the building, of the truck on the side, which is kind of battered and beat up. So we had a little bit of a conversation about this one. And um, so go ahead, Paul. What do you have to say about that one? Well, it started out, first of all, thank you. Um, yeah. it, it started out, um, the original photograph that I took was all in kind of beige as the junction boxes were be light beige and the wall was a little bit darker beige and the ground was a little bit grayer beige. The only real color in it was the truck and the road and the trees in the background. Uh, and so this was a great adventure for me because I just changed all the colors around. I made the wall blue and, and this is a pretty easy color combination because yellow and blue are opposites in the spectrum and they naturally go together. So um, that color combination solved a lot for me. And then the rest of it is just um, placing values in the correct place and making the shadows look good. But I was happy with it because it just works so well with it, with substituting color. It just, uh, it was an ordinary scene Mm -hmm. that turned into something special and I'm and I'm beginning I'm getting more and more obsessed with that kind of scene that I can manipulate and change that way. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I want to ask you about two things on again on this piece. So we're kind of dwelling on that one. It looks from the viewer's point that your colors have been layered on the on the is it paper or what is it that it, it's on? I use um, untempered masonite, which is um, pretty oil free. It's very archival, and I make my own ground. So it's it's a kind of a papery ground uh, that I coat the mason with masonite with after I've sanded it quite a bit. And I like it because it has a tremendous amount of texture with it but I can also manipulate it so that areas are smoother and uh, more uniform and it, it really works out for me. And the other thing that really helps out is that it's so different from most other surfaces that it by you know it just physically sets us sits it sets it apart from other um, pastels. And it's a very interesting piece um, because of the extraordinary um, composition with that the the viewer is looking around the corner at the disappearing truck and so it to some extent it tells a a story of something that you don't know what's going on uh, and so it's a uh, my opinion i i happen to be very contemporary in my like of that as much as I am really hot for these of Maryland's. And I mean, look at this, this young woman in her red hair. Um, would that be a relative? Should we? Oh, you're, you're muted, Marilyn. Uh, come um, back to us. Sorry about that. Um, actually, that model is the same model that was wearing that yellow dress in the other painting that you showed. Oh, this one? Um, Yes, that's the same model. And um, she just had, she'd let her hair grow and something different about her. And similar to what Paul was doing in her paint, in his painting, is that I was not married to the kind of reality of what she actually was wearing. She was done in my studio. I had photographs that I had done at a farmer's market and I thought wouldn't it be great to kind of juxtapose her hair color with the blue and white striped awnings mm -hmm. and then create um, a design on her clothing so that it becomes a painting and a composition not just that I was doing a picture of of the a face girl. well a, the way you've done that the the awning and the two poles yeah. and then the red uh items on each side the basket of fruit and what looks like maybe flowers it creates a frame uh right in the picture before you even put the frame on the piece 
Yeah. And now, do you use paper or uh, do you have something special that we need to hear about, like Paul's Masonite? Well, no, I don't have enough time in my life to be making my own background, my own surfaces. I buy a, a commercial sanded paper that's made specifically for using with pastels. It, the manufacturer has a number of different uh, formulation so they have some surfaces that are grittier than others. I use one that's less gritty because I don't think I want that much texture in somebody's skin, you know. So I, I, so I go towards a smoother, uniform, textured paper. It's an archival sanded paper so that, and all of my pastels are as archival as what's currently available. So I just can layer a lot of different layers on using that sanded paper. Interesting. And do you do use the finger or do you use yeah, the stop? I have, I have two problems about the finger. Yes, I tend, I mean, there's, there's controversy in lots of things that have to do with pastels, like don't rub it with your finger because you have oils in your finger and now you might be contaminating your pastels. I also, like oil painters use a mall stick off, you know, to keep from getting their, they're using a brush, but they don't want to get into the wet paint. I tend to use my pinky and my fingernail to balance my hand when I'm putting strokes on. So I often have little spots of something that's left over. So I have to, I take a little soft brush and kind of blend those out when I'm, when I'm working on it, things that I don't want to appear in the final picture. Mm -hmm. So I'm dying to ask uh, Nicholas, uh, I, with the extraordinary uh, uh, detail that we had in this piece, and I should move probably to this one. I mean, the the tiny details here. Uh, hi, you said you were blending that with fingers? And um, that's hard to believe. How do you do it? Uh, it, it just kind of like with the flower petals there, uh, basically blend, blended into the, uh, the, as I go along and uh, wherever it needs some, some sort of shading or whatever, my fingers are used. With the uh, Chinese pot and the fan, um, there, there are points like in the Chinese pot itself that I've used pastel pencils to uh, get mm. the, uh, to actually get some of the detail there. Mm. Uh, not a lot of blending in the Chinese pot, but uh, the fan itself, I did use some, some uh, blending techniques. Yeah, it's all, all just my finger as I go along. Uh, <laughs> background and whatever. And uh, it seems like over the years I blend less, but again, just trying to get the realism. And uh, the paper I use is uh, made by Sennelier and it's called La Carte. And I use that almost exclusively. It's, a, uh, it's actually made with vegetable fi fibers, which is kind of interesting. You can't get it wet. So I can't, uh, I don't do any underpainting with it. Uh, and you can't sneeze on it or you'll have little spots of where it, it melts off. So, but like somebody said, you know, I can't sneeze. I will turn your head when you sneeze. But, uh, but you, again, you can't have anything that might spray against it. It, it destroys it. But, uh, and in fact, I actually saw an artist once that used, used it to the benefit. Uh, he or she, I don't remember what it was, but uh, would paint like a seashell on the, on the Sennelier then mask off the, the seashell and wet down the rest of it to take the whole background of, of the paper out. So it was just like the white card on the back and it, uh -huh. you know, you can to your benefit. But uh, for myself, I cover the entire sheet with pastel and that's the way it works, but. Wow, I, <laughs> I, I this is fascinating, but we haven't touched on one thing is, I, I think a great many people have the impression that pastel is a more fugitive uh, kind of a 
uh, medium. And that is absolutely not true that watercolor is probably more liable to fade. Uh, and as you said, oil paints will crack over centuries. Uh, do you do you lacquer, uh, is, if that is the correct term, for your pieces? How, how do you solve that? And then, then we want to hear from everybody else, too. Some people use fixative. Uh, it, uh, a fixative will often darken the painting. So I don't use anything. Uh, basically, once I've finished the painting, when I'm ready to frame it, um, I take it outside and I bang the back, back of it, spank it on the back of it, and any of the loose pastel dust comes off. It doesn't hurt the painting at all. Uh, but yeah, then I frame it and uh, I frame it as a sandwich. There's a little spacer in between the glass and the painting, about an eighth of an inch. I use an adhesive, it has an adhesive on it. You put the spacer all the way around and the uh, uh, then you put your pastel on a backing board, a foam core usually, uh, and then lay the spacer glass on top of that and then use a, uh, a I use actually Scotch magic tape, you know, because it, it's acid free uh, all the way around and it sticks really well. Uh, but you make you basically hermetically seal the entire pastel painting in this sandwich but between the uh, glass and the spacer and, and the painting. And uh, what's good about that is you can put it into the frame and uh, use the thing to, to, to hold it in the frame. And then later on, if you want to take it out of the frame and put another one in that frame, it's all sandwich, just take it out. You store this, this, uh, the pastel just like that, put another one in and be off with it. So, so you're making a, a sealed sandwich so that you're true. never rehandling, exposing your pastel to elements, whether it is, as you said, sneezing on it or, or, or pussycat <laughs> suddenly deciding that's the moment to come onto your table. And, and so with the tape that goes all the way around everything and you just pop that out and then um, new diamond points and you put a new one in and how wonderful. Uh, it sounds like a great way to do it. Uh, Marilyn, you were shaking your head <laughs> and I know you have something to say about uh, the pres preserving of it and how how pastels really over centuries have retained their color. Yes, well, I mean, that is one of the advantages of the fact that pastels are made using pure pigments and they, depending on who the manufacturer is, they're really very um, enduring and light fast, though, like any fine art piece, I mean, you wouldn't want to be exposing this to direct sunlight over a huge period of time. But also now we have the advantage of glass that is anti-reflective and is UV protective so that I, I use an um, anti-reflective glass. I don't use the conservation, museum conservation clear, but there is a certain element of UV protection from that glass and so I think the paintings will last a long time in that if they're framed with using that. And I use a similar method to Nicholas's, though I don't create a permanent taped in package. I use the AR glass, anti-reflective glass. I use those spacers. I mount my painting onto an archival foam core and then I put it in the frame and then I seal the backing board once it's you know face down in the frame I use tape to seal the painting in the frame um, and if at some point I decide I need to reuse that frame I can always just cut that tape and take the painting out. Cut that out yeah well I think uh, what you've just said is so important because I'm sure a great many of our listeners will have visited the George O'Keefe Museum in Santa Fe 
And of course, the drawing room, um, it's a very low light level because right. of the fading characteristics of the materials used um, at that time and by her. And it, it, what an advantage to say that just ordinary good care of artwork I mean, the same as good care of your drapes and your sofa. Uh, That's right. <laughs> interestingly enough, that it didn't take anything special to preserve this wonderful medium. So um, going on to another thing, tell us about this very unusual picture on, um, on the uh, right side of the screen. Uh, obviously there's a story there and it, it looks like it's from Kosovo or something. No, oh. well, <laughs> it actually was Nassau. Um, I had been on a trip that was supposed to go somewhere else and the cruise ship was diverted to Nassau. And so I went walking around and I, took photos like any good tourist with my iPhone. <laughs> and I had lots of pictures and I was really taken by, I got back to the studio and I was like, oh, are any of these going to become paintings? And I was really taken by this man walking down this street past this building that had clearly suffered some traumatic, in some tropical storm, something had been done to it. And, you know, yet he was just, I thought of this as resilience that people go on and he's just walking down the street and he's got his bucket and he's going to, I don't know if he's going to repair that building or clean it up, but I just loved how there were things shooting out through the wall, through the windows, the empty window spaces, and that somehow this could be repaired and rebuilt and that people go on no matter what is thrown at them. An unusual subject and a challenging one, but it, we love storytelling in our paintings. There's no doubt about that. We don't want them to match the sofa that I was talking about <laughs> there. No, we want we want the painting first and then the sofa. Right. <laughs> make that work. And so I, I want to look, uh, Paul, at your wonderful, more traditional Southwest uh, subject matter. I mean, traditional, of course not. It, it is. You definitely don't see the blue coyote or is it, yeah, with the red neckerchief or something <laughs> like this. I, not, not, now, I happen to like coyotes as much as the next girl, but I thought these were quite interesting. And again, compositionally, I, I was really taken with what you did and the brilliance of the color. You really, that's where you move is this, this incredible color. Well, I'm, I'm obsessed with lately with composition. Uh, the, the wine shed, the one that would be on your left, the, the sand colored building. Um, I, I, there's a kind of composition that I call um, unbalanced symmetry. And in the wine shed, everything's happening on one side of the painting and not much is happening on the other. And as a compositional element, um, I really, like those things they they I, I get accused of being a little bit too cerebral sometimes but um i'm i'm really taken with that the other the other uh pastel of black mesa is a pretty rudimentary com uh, composition it has a an arroyo that leads you to the back of the painting and uh there's a secondary directional compositional compositional element of the of the cottonwood trees that are yellow that also draw you back through the painting. And most people like to have a composition where your eye lands at one point on the painting. And I like to create compositions where your eye continues through to the back and maybe even beyond. And it does very much. Make it a little bit more um, dynamic. And what else is interesting to me about the composition here is that the heavy part is at the top. And, you know, way back when in art school, uh, 
I was very annoyed when the teacher put a painting that I had upside down and I had meant the, the heavy portion to be at the top. And so I'm, I'm appreciating the road and how it leads the eye. And I wanted to show these of yours as well. I mean, this extraordinary color change of the antique train. I mean, how much fun is that? A lot of fun. <laughs> that, was a, that was another painting that was basically dark greens and dark browns and um, um, gray browns. And I just, just changed all the colors around and it, it, it just changes it totally into another different kind of painting. Well, you're a contemporary fauve. <laughs> a fauve. <Yeah. laughs> um, I, I like the fauves. Um, um, I, in college and early in my career as a graphic designer, I wasn't too excited about the impressionists or the fauves or the constructionists or um, people like Marcel Duchamp. Uh, but the more I got into it, the more really interesting they became, especially Duchamp. Well, I, I think it, 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 it makes everybody stop and examine the detail where the more realistic, in this case, probably wouldn't have the appeal. The viewer, I mean, it, it's the sidewalk appeal of the front of your painting. <laughs> the, the irony is, is that if you're looking at that train, you wouldn't give, you wouldn't give it a second glance That's because correct. it was a shadow and the colors were all monochrome. And, and I, I just live for those kinds of things. Um, I, I misdirection is kind of one of my favorite things as well. So uh, color helped me misdirect all the things that were happening in that train. And it really turned out to be a good painting. And yet on the one on the other side from the, from the paint, you know, looking at the train part, I. That, that's just astonishing. And then we go the other direction. And I think that the rain is about to fall. And I can, I can smell the raindrops and that there's a little ozone just from your color. Well, I love storms um, and skies that are part of storms. So when I'm, when I'm out looking for landscapes to paint, I'm partial to late in the day like that. And the other neat thing about late in the day is there's a lot of atmospheric things happening. For instance, clouds that are potentially huge storms juxtaposed with uh, big, bright, saturated, warm light falling on the church itself. And that, again, that's another element of composition that I really like, uh, which is the contrast. Composing and, uh, with and I, the light. Yeah, and the Nicholas, subtlety. Yeah. in the background and in the um in in where the uh roof and you can see that there's various colors in the roof and then going into the cloud i i think that's masterful so i i'm very taken with that one and i'm not a landscape liker myself and yet that one really appealed to me as much as these just uh, knocked my socks off, Nicholas, especially uh, the left-hand side one. I, I said, hoo -hoo. and of course, um, well, my best girlfriend happens to live down in ranchos, and she has 360 degrees, and every night it is like this. And so, <laughs> unfortunately, everybody thinks that you've taken liberties with the color but you haven't it's real it's uh basically i'm i look out my bedroom right now and that's that it would be that scene you know because it's the it called from my front yard and it was uh just one of those days where some, you know i go for a walk every night and oftentimes i get some dramatic sunsets uh and sometimes, you know, when you're walking, it's like the clouds are right, everything's good, and it just fizzles, you know? It's like, what happened? It's not there, you know? Uh, but but certain times you hit one like that, and it's like, and no, normally the sunsets are over to my, to the west. Uh, I mean, which is where sunsets are. 
However, that particular one was to the, to the north. And it was like, boy, you know, it just really, uh, it, the, the sunset over on the west side was a little bit uh, dry, but this one was just perfect. So yeah, uh, no enhancement necessary. It's like the New Mexico sunsets can be just absolutely gorgeous. So. Mother nature is astonishing to say the least. And I, I wish that the reproduction flat here showed more of the detail in this lower area. You have all kinds of color shading there. So as much as, well, that's, that of course is the problem all the photographers have. How do you represent these deep, deep, deep shadows and this extraordinary brilliance in the sky. And you have to resort to all sorts of tricks to get that done. And here you, you've done it. I, I, I believe that one sold in the show, did it not? Well, it, it's, it's, it's still in my closet. <laughs> <laughs> still in your closet. Okay. Well, then everybody needs to know that if you want to take home a, a bit of New Mexico of how it really is, <laughs> there's, the, there's a, a couple of good examples <laughs> overall. I, I, we are close to our end of time. I, I want to ask more about the show and your organization, but Karen, do we have any chats? Did you have anything? I, I kind of monopolized the conversation here and you always have good things to say. I have a couple of questions. Um, so one, I wanted to just, maybe all three of you could touch on it. I noticed that there's, there's really an element of community outreach with the Pastel Society and sharing um, the arts and doing programs such as these and the demos and whatnot. And along with that, I've noticed that all three of you, um, a large part of your, your um, personal bios, you really focus on the workshops that you've done and sort of the mentorships that you have felt with other artists. And so I was curious maybe what some of your highlighted experiences or who you consider your mentors to be and talk a little bit about that aspect of the National Pastel Society that includes such collaboration and mentorship. I'm, I'm autodidactic, I'm self-taught. Self so uh, everything that I, uh, even being self-taught, you can't work in a vacuum. So it's always good to have a mentorship of, uh, and with our society, we have monthly demonstrations where people come in and do demonstrations. The workshops that we have attended are great because uh, a lot of times you'll get like the, with the recent Desmond O'Hagan uh, workshop. He's a great artist. He paints in a certain style, but there are certain things you learn from him on color and texture and everything that you can, it uh, might, you don't want to paint just like a person, but you, you gain things to use in your own paintings. So. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I just wanted to weigh in. I had the privilege of being the coordinator for Desmond's workshop that we did this past weekend. And I must say that one of the wonderful things about the Pastel Society of New Mexico is that we've been around for a long time. We are one of the societies that kind of our national shows have been going on far longer than most other societies as the um, popularity of pastels has grown. More societies, regional societies have popped up, but we've had these shows and the in general, the judge of our national show would give a three-day workshop. And no matter what you say about being how you're taught and what you've learned, most um, art, there's, there's not a lot of new information coming out about how to paint. You know, certain things are standards, you know, knowing how to draw and practicing drawing, learning about composition, learning about values. They're, they're not inventing new 
value scales. Th these are the fundamentals. But when you have a person who's been selected to be the judge because those people have already attained uh, quite a stature in the pastel world and you attend their workshops, it reinforces things that you've already learned. It gives you a chance to experiment with new techniques of how you might work. And then you take that and you continue on your own personal journey and you incorporate the things that you've learned from other people into your own style of what you're doing. And, um, and as you paint, like Paul's talked about, where he is now in his painting, you evolve as an artist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the goal, I think, is always that you feel like you want to be improving your artwork and growing as an artist, not just saying, I've reached this point and I never want to paint anything else. I'm just going to continue painting this one thing, this one way. Um, I don't, personally, I can't see that as a goal in my artistic career. I feel like I always want to be learning something new and improving my artwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I would have to agree with, with Marilyn in that I don't, I don't particularly want to ever do one thing for the rest of my life. Um, I'm sort of an art sponge. Uh, I've been doing artwork since I was 19 in one form or the other. Um, I had the chance to see uh, a lot of the Renaissance painters at Del Prado in, Mad in Madrid and also the Vatican Museum, among others. And I'm just stunned. Um, you know, what we're doing seems to be primitive compared to the sophistication um, levels that they were doing in the 18th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. I, um, my favorite artist is uh, a man named Mark Rothko. Uh, I don't exactly understand how his work influences mine, but uh, there's a there's a very circuitous circuitous um, direction from from what I've seen to what I see as inspiration for my work. Um, but I'm, I'm all over the place in terms of, of where I get um, art inspiration or what I think is interesting. As I mentioned before, I, I wasn't originally interested in the Impressionists. Um, I particularly like the post-Impressionists like Seurat and uh, um, Cezanne and, and then all these other guys that just came up with all these wondrous things like the Fauves and especially the Bauhaus. And so I, I, I'm, I've just been all over the place when it comes to how things affect my art. Mm -hmm. I am just absolutely bowled over by the variety of inspiration and mm -hmm. output from the three of you. I, it is absolutely delightful. One piece after another is a, a little feast for the eyes. Uh, uh, so I, I'm very grateful that you were willing to come and tell us all about these, these things. And I, I learned a whole bunch and I, I, that it's not my art. And, and now I know more about it and I can be a better appreciator without doubt. Uh, so best of luck and wishes to everybody. Uh, Karen, anything further I, that you wanted I, I, to what, bring up? Yeah, I have one last question that I want to um, ask of Marilyn and that um, when I was learning about you and reading your bio and that you had come from New York and sort of landed in New Mexico, just enchanted with the landscape and so inspired by that as an artist, course what did I think I thought oh that's just like Millicent so I don't know <laughs> if you know how much you know about Millicent but she was an artist in her own right, right. and so I just wanted to hear any little snippet about your experience of encountering the Southwest encountering New Mexico and whatever sort of aha inspirational moment occurred that made you relocate here well I I'd done a fair amount of traveling. I'd always been interested in native culture and also hot air balloons. And so I've been to lots of different- Who places. knew? 
<laughs> and right, and I said, I am going, I'm not going to do the traditional thing that New Yorkers seem to do and just head straight south. I'm going west. And it was it was the best thing that I could have done. And I was just enchanted every even still, I've lived here since 94. Mm -hmm. Anytime I drive out of Albuquerque, I the landscape just amazes me. I am always fascinated by the and the lights and the sky and the clouds. I, I just can't get enough of it. Um, and so I did start a fine art career after doing commercial work for mm -hmm. most of my life. Um, and it was about doing landscapes. And then when I found the studio that I'm in and they have, we have weekly models, it was like, oh, I like painting people too. That was my background because I'd been a student at the Fashion Institute of Technology. So now I do figurative work and I still do some landscape work, but I'm not as anxious these days to pack up my stuff and go plain air painting. I mm -hmm. take a lot of pictures and I can, I will do things maybe from photographs and I don't have to travel as far and wide to do uh, landscape paintings, but mm -hmm. New Mexico's the best for an art, for doing artwork. <laughs> the, the number of artists and the camaraderie. And um, I also a member of the plein air painters of New Mexico. And I believe Paul is as well. And he's a signature member or a master at, mm -hmm. in the plein air painters society. So we just have lots of wonderful opportunities yeah. available to us here. Yeah. In the last couple of minutes, uh, please give us the full name of your local organization as well as the national and how people can get more information about them. Nicholas, perhaps that's you. The Pastel Society of New Mexico. And if you want to get uh, go on our website, it's www.pastels as in Sam, N is in Nancy, M is in Mexico.org pastelsnm.org and uh, Marilyn is the uh, webmaster and she uh, she does a good job in keeping that up to date. Uh, we have the newsletter posted on it and uh, a lot of information about uh, the organization, uh, its founding uh, and uh, what shows are coming. Uh, the newsletter also posts when our meetings are. Uh, they're free to join us uh, to come to. It's at the uh, the Art Museum in Albuquerque, and uh, the second Saturday of every month. And it's free to attend. And like I said, we often have uh, a demonstration where somebody will demonstrate uh, by doing a pastel painting and talk about it, talk about what they're doing. They actually project the artwork on the wall as they're painting. So even people in the district of the museum uh, auditorium can see the strokes that they're making. So uh, yeah, join us. And then you each have websites. If you want to talk about those and mention those, you can also put it um, in, put it in the chat if you want to type in your chat or I can do that as you're sharing it. I'd like, I'd like to make one quick comment. Sure. Um, the one of the great gifts that we have as New Mexico artists is the quality of light in the state. It, it doesn't exist in many other places. Uh, and that quality of light is mostly in northern New Mexico, Taos, Abiquiu, areas like that, maybe southern Utah and northern Arizona. Um, there's a, a, a permeating, saturating kind of warmish light that just makes landscape painting or painting in New Mexico in general um, a real treat and it's a real gift um, that, that I, I feel as a landscape artist and an artist um, is just something that helps us out tremendously. As far as my website, it's G as in Gail, my wife's name, P, Paul, 
gpmurray.com, M-U-R-R-A-Y.com. I like the uh, thought of the light. And I would tell you that it is not just the physical light, but there is a spirit in that light that you have all trapped. And I, I can't say enough for uh, thanking you all for letting us be part of, of your fingers <laughs> for such a long panel. Thank you all most kindly. And thank you, Sarah, for um, moderating the panel. Thanks to our panelists. And I just want to say, as we kind of wrap it up, that um, the museum is open 10 to 5, and the National Pastel Show and Sale is going on until September um, 21st, um, just to clarify, 10 to 5 daily. And so um, we look forward to um, next month's program, and thank you for joining us to our attendees. Thanks, bye bye, everybody. Bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.